Hello everybody and welcome to the Thursday edition of Video Clips. Just a couple of announcements. Tomorrow starts our conference, so hopefully you'll be joining us. If not, you'll be hearing about it next week because I'm sure I won't be able to shut up because it's so exciting, everything that happens at conference. But um, anyway, tomorrow's our conference, November 2nd through 4th, and then uh, next Wednesday, uh, November 7th, Conversations with Dr. Pam. We're going to give the guys equal attention and talk about PSA testing and prostate cancer. And of course, you can ask questions too, so bring your good questions questions about diet, health, and medicine to that call. Okay, so I have two topics I want to talk about today, and the first one is vitamin D. And I've covered this a lot because it's an important issue, an area in which there is great misunderstanding. Um, and so you can read a lot about this in the Health Briefs Online Library if you choose to. But here is the issue. We have a lot of docs right now who are testing all their patients for vitamin D levels and prescribing sometimes, I think, dangerously high doses of vitamin D supplementation. And many of the patients who are getting these supplements already have what the Institute of Medicine has defined as normal vitamin D levels. Um, right now, between 20 and 30 nanograms per milliliter is a normal vitamin D level. So a recent study published in the Journal of the, Amer the, Journal of the American Medical Association showed that patients who took 100,000 international units of vitamin D monthly for 18 months developed the same number of respiratory infections as those who took a placebo. They experienced symptoms for just as long and they missed just as many days of work. Now this is not the first time I've reported on a study that has shown that uh, massive doses of vitamin D don't seem to make a difference in a variety of different health outcomes. So here's how the study was structured. Patients taking vitamin D got 200,000 international units initially, then 30 days later they got another 200,000 international units, and then they took 100,000 international units every month for 18 months. Now, in spite of what I think are dangerous uh, levels of vitamin D supplementation, um, their levels only increased from an average of 29 to 49 uh, nanograms during this 18 month period of time. And so this actually documents a point that I've been making for a long time, which is that oral supplementation is a very inefficient way to raise vitamin D levels. And um, without any benefit here, we, we saw no reduction in upper respiratory infections, we have all of the risks associated with vitamin D. And I get asked about this all the time, so I'll give you a partial list of the side effects of vitamin D. Excessive thirst, metal taste in the mouth, loss of appetite, weight loss, nausea, fatigue, pain in the bones, osteoporosis, vision problems, itchy skin, vomiting, diarrhea, constipation, muscle damage, and cancer. Those are some of the potential side effects of particularly high doses of vitamin D. Now what I found very interesting, um, when a study like this comes out that I know uh, really is um, going to be commented on by a lot of people, you can get on the internet, and you can read what doctors are saying about it and blogs, and so I did that. And uh, a lot of doctors who are promoters of this vitamin D hypothesis that vitamin D levels are related to disease, and they may well be, by the way, we just don't have a cause and effect relationship established. In other words, we don't know that vitamin D levels are responsible for cancer and lupus and and heart disease, and, and this study and many others don't show that, that there's much of a preventive function for vitamin D or, or ability to cure disease with vitamin D. But in any case, some of the defenders of vitamin D were quick to point out that the reason why this study showed no benefit is that the, um, the patients who were in the trial already had um, normal levels of uh, vitamin D, normal blood levels. And, what was most interesting to me about that is that some of these doctors are the ones who've written books and articles that have said that actually vitamin D levels should be much higher than the 20 to 30 nanograms that the Institute of Medicine has uh, proposed. And so I'm unfortunately seeing the same behavior with regard to this issue that we see with regard to mammography and uh, PSA testing and all kinds of procedures and drugs where when the evidence um, just shows that the party line is wrong, we just adjust the, um, uh, the storyline, we spin it uh, to make sure that the story still works with the, with the new facts instead of just admitting that maybe it's time for a change in direction. So in any case, I, I guess I'm just holding fast to this idea that I think we're making a big issue out of something that is not responsible for most of the disease that we're seeing, and I think we're inducing disease with these high doses of vitamin D. Okay, so the other thing I wanted to cover was calorie restriction and longevity, and boy do I have some good news for you here. 
Um, I think most people don't like the idea of severe calorie restriction as a way to prolong life or improve health. And, um, uh, but some people have been willing to adopt it because they really want to live for a long time. And, and I have to say, I love living, but i got to tell you something. I love eating, too. And so I want to live a long, healthy life. But if I have to do it starving to death, I guess I just don't want to sign up for that program. I guess also, I really haven't seen any proof up until now that severe calorie restriction um, really would work in the sense of prolonging life. So anyway, for, the, for those of us who love to eat, it doesn't appear that severe calorie restriction prolongs life. Um, this particular study was published on August 30th in the journal Nature, and it reported the findings of a 25-year study in which rhesus monkeys were fed 30% less calories than monkeys in a control group. Now, it was true that um, the 57 monkeys in the calorie restriction group had stronger hearts and immune systems and lower rates of diabetes, cancer, and other degenerative diseases than those monkeys who did not uh, have to practice calorie restriction, but they didn't live longer. And so, um, and, and in fact, in looking at the studies that have examined um, calorie restriction, I think study design is an issue. For example, a study published in 2009 showed that calorie restricted monkeys live longer than their well fed counterparts, but the well fed monkeys were eating about 30% of their calories from sugar, so they weren't eating a very good diet. So, um, I think one of the, the issues with calorie restriction, I've been saying this for a long time, is that if you calorie restrict, what goes out of the diet are a lot of animal foods and junk foods because those are calorie concentrated foods. And I think it's the benefit of getting those out of the diet that creates any positive effect. That's certainly what we saw with the monkey study, less disease, um, you know, stronger hearts and immune systems. So I think the actual benefit is the foods that are taken out of the diet, not calorie restriction. So um, in any case, you know, my whole thing at Wellness Forum, when I started this company, I talked a lot about living longer, and I realized something early on. You know, we have enough machinery to keep you alive in this country for just about as long as you're willing to subject yourself to that type of treatment. So people here live a long time. They just don't have very good quality of life. And so like the calorie-restricted rhesus monkeys, if you eat a health-promoting diet with those calorie-dense foods gone, you know, the animal foods and the processed foods and junk foods and that sort of thing, if you really reduce or eliminate those foods, um, you can have a much better quality of life. And that's really what it's all about. I mean, however many years I'm going to be here, I, I don't get to decide that. But I just want them all to be great. You know, so I want to live and then I want to die. I don't want to spend a whole lot of time going into gradual degeneration, which is, I think, what most people do. So, um, if you're a person like me, I'm a foodie, I love to eat, I enjoy great food, and gosh, thank God I have our Chef Del here in the building, so I can eat really well all the time. Um, it isn't starvation that's going to help you, it really is choosing the right foods, and a well-structured plant-based diet can buy you the same quality of life without the calorie restriction. All right, that's it for today. I'll talk to you next week. As usual, feel free to pass this on to anybody who you think would benefit from watching it. Thank you for joining me today.